Welcome to the second lecture in Module 3. We'll be co covering Perception and Action in Development, which is covered in Chapter 11 of the textbook. We're going to go over Cognitive and Motor Development, Perception and Self-Produced Motion, Locomotor Experience to the Development of Depth Perception, Spatial Perception, Surface Texture Perception, and Slope Perception. We're also going to discuss the interrelationship between perception and action, as well as postural control and balance. When discussing perception and action, we need to remember the importance of movement and that it plays a critical role in both perceptual development as well as cognitive development. There is a relationship between cognition and motor development as the prefrontal cortex and the cerebellum develop in parallel. The prefrontal cortex determines complex cognitive operations, while the cerebellum is important for motor functions. Studies have shown that both structures develop into adolescence, and the brain areas associated with motor and cognition co-activate during motor tasks. We also know that many children with cognition disorders such as ADHD, dyslexia, and autism frequently have motor deficits as well. This leads us to ask the question, can movement actually improve cognition? Research has shown that exercise does help cognitive development. Specifically, exercise increases the amount of BDNF in the brain. BDNF is brain-derived neurotropic factor and it's a group of proteins associated with the building and maintenance of the infrastructure of the nervous system. BDNF stimulates the growth of neurons and it protects against neuron loss. It also strengthens the connection among neurons. Research has been done in animal studies and has found that exercise increases the amount of BDFN in the hippocampus. The hippocampus plays a role in learning and memory processing. So we know that exercise helps cognition, but how exactly are perception and action related to one another? If we think of perception and action linearly, we're not really able to answer this question because we don't know how perception influences action. We just know that it does. We're left here with a black box in the middle. A better metaphor for understanding the perception-action relationship is the perception-action loop where the perce perception and action simultaneously influence one another. We can say that perception and action are coupled and processed together as without action there cannot be perception and without perception we're not able to, to move or produce action. The perception-action loop comes out of the theory of affordances studied by Gibson. In his paper, he describes affordances of the environment as what the object provides for the animal in terms of opportunity for movement. We can think of the affordances in the environment as the opportunity the environment provides for movement. For example, if there's a chair in the environment, the object's the object affords that we can move from standing to lower ourselves and sit into the chair. As we grow and develop, the perception of affordance in the environment changes as our capabilities change. For example, when we see a chair in the environment as a one-year-old, it does not afford movement such that we can lower from standing and sit in it because oftentimes we will be smaller than the chair itself. At that age, the chair affords movement such that the infant can use it to support itself while walking. When we grow older, our body proportions change, and the chair now affords movement that allows us to sit in it. Like we mentioned in the other slide, perception is body scaled, and we perceive the opportunities to move based on our own body proportions. In an experiment conducted in the 1970s, Researchers measured how people perceive their ability to climb a step and whether or not that perception is based on individual height. They had a group of shorter participants and a group of taller participants, and they showed both groups a series of risers and asked them to rate the climbability of those steps. 
They found that the participants rated the climbability based on their individual height, indicating that perception is related to body scale. They rated risers that were more than 88% of their leg length as unclimbable. So for the shorter group, 88% of their leg length was smaller than for the taller group. They have also conducted similar experiments with older adults and found that older adults rated stairs as unclimbable at a lower percentage of maximal leg length because strength deteriorates in older adulthood. And individuals' perceptions of their own body strength also influence the ability to perceive the opportunities for movement in the environment. So we've talked now about how perception shapes locomotion, but how does locomotion shape perception? In order to study this, researchers placed two kittens in a merry-go-round apparatus. One cat walked through the merry-go-round, while the other one was placed in a cart-like device and was passively moved throughout the merry-go-round. They then placed the kittens in the merry-go-round without it moving to see how the kittens who had two different experiences moved through the merry-go-round. They found that the kitten who was passively moved in the cart failed to judge depth perception and appeared to be unfamiliar with the environment when approaching objects, whereas the cat that actively walked through the merry-go-round, even though it was guided, did not exhibit such behaviors. And this experiment really showed that self-produced movement is necessary for normal perceptual development. So how exactly does the locomotor experience teach us depth perception? In the previous lecture, we talked about the visual cliff experiment where infants were placed on a plexiglass surface which made one half of the cliff look solid and the other half looked transparent, creating a visual cliff. They found that 10% of infants cross the cliff and have not yet developed a fear of heights. The infants who crossed the cliff were those who had less crawling experience, and the earlier crawlers who had more experience were more likely to stay in the solid area. Well, so what else do infants gain from crawling around? I'm going to watch this quick video to answer that question. Emmett is a very new crawler. His attention is kept forward to focus his eye line and to determine whether he's picking up information out of the corner of his eyes. When the walls move, Emmett doesn't notice. Adults in his position would have the illusion that they themselves are moving. But because Emmett is such a new crawler, he hasn't learned to pay attention to the information flowing in through his peripheral vision. But at nine months, Emmeline has had lots of experience crawling. She reacts quite strongly. Afraid of losing her balance, her body readjusts each time to maintain a sense of stability. What has made her sensitive to her peripheral vision is her active crawling experience, and that experience will allow her to have a healthy fear of heights. So, from that video, we can see how crawling experience allows for the development of perceptual vision. Younger crawlers had not yet developed perceptual vi peripheral vision, excuse me, Whereas the more experienced crawlers reacted to the moving room because their crawling experience helped develop their peripheral vision. We'll stop the video here and we'll continue talking about perception and action in the next video.